right, so welcome everyone. So uh, today's it's Passover, so we're gonna have a we're gonna try and stay to an hour, so that those like me that are observant can go focus on our Zoom-based Passover experience. <laughs> um, so welcome everyone. Though looks like there's a few people just coming in, so I'll give it a moment. So um, just for those that weren't here, so just let everyone know that, um, and let me just make sure we have everything covered. Yeah, great. All right, so we'll, we'll stick to, do, we'll do our best to stick to an hour. Some of the slides towards the end are a lot about different supplements and things, and there's a lot of information in there that I think I'm actually gonna uh, uh, just blow through and just talk about the supplements overall. And, and then that'll allow some time for a Q&A, which I think will be great. Um, and my intention is to, you know, cover some of the stuff we've covered before, but move into some other areas as well. In particular, my plan today is to talk about statistics up front, um, again, like we do every other time, just to get a fresh sort of view on that. And then to, we'll move in and, um, and then we'll talk more once we move into uh, sort of work through the statistics part, we'll really, um, then go and move, talk a bit more about masks. I want to talk a little bit more about that, about that conversation and help you guys understand that a little bit more detail. Um, and then also a little bit about clinical presentations um, and how people present. And then we'll talk about tests. Um, I want to talk a bit, a lot of people are asking about antibody testing. I thought we'd talk a bit about that. Um, and then the next section really is about some of the prevention strategies that, that we can think about doing. Um, that are more supplement-based um, options and and, um, and and lifestyle, and then hopefully we can do that in 35 minutes or so, and then we'll leave some time for sort of questions and answers and things like that. So that's 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 sort of the arc, the, the journey of our of the webinar for this week. Um, and um, I'll just let you know. Let's see if I can um, share this with you. Some of you know this, but I I uh, let's see. Just give me a moment. Um, yeah, let's see. So if you can see that, okay. Um, so this is a new five hundred one c three that we uh, we created as of actually last week and. I've mentioned this to some of you. I just want to let everyone know it exists. We're really excited about it. Um, it's a group of us, um, mostly tech folks in the Valley, um, but a mix of different people with finance and legal and a couple docs like me and a neurosurgeon named Jim Dottie, who's down at Stanford, who runs the Center for Altruism and Compassion at Stanford, um, have created this 501c nonprofit focused on procuring personal protective equipment. Um, so we're raising money. Um, we're finding people that want to donate supplies. We're finding people that want to contribute financially. And then we're um, vetting sort of that side of the, the, the equation and then identifying um, healthcare professionals, hospitals and hospital systems that, uh, that need this. Um, and so you can see here, so, you know, opportunities for people to supply their products, request it or donate. Um, so we have, um, this is our crew, uh, Megan Pye, um, who may be on this call with us today, um, is our CEO, chair of the board. And we've got a rock star group here working with us. Um, and um, if you're inclined and you feel like passing the word, please do. Um, you can um, donate here and it goes to a GoFundMe page. Um, and you can see here we're um, for requesting and for supplying, we're on uh, this website, 1.3 acres, which has over 120 million visits already. And we're the new piece here around PPE. And you can see all the requests that have been made already. Um, so just wanted to share that with you. Put a lot of time into making this happen and now it's a reality. And we already have tens of thousands of um, N95 respirators coming our way as we speak. Um, so I'm gonna now just um, see if I can shift over a little bit um, to our talk. So, uh, 
I'm managing multiple screens, so bear with me and make sure this all works. And uh, great. So, um, so for this week, I want to give a bit of an update. Um, really, sort of focused on where we're at. So we've sort of jumped now. We've, um, and this is. Um, as of about what eight days ago, and now we've got 1.5, close to 1.5 million uh, confirmed cases, uh, with 87,000 deaths. U.S. is far above everyone else, despite the fact that President Trump says we're doing a terrific job. Um, and if you look at the arc, you can see here. This was in the Financial Times. The, you you can see the U.S. just this is, looks at deaths. Um, just you can see everyone else starting to flatten, um, and you can see us still on a pretty vertical arc, unfortunately. Um, but you'll start. I'll show you some other data just to show you, give you a sense for um, the impact of social distancing. So we're all sort of in our in our sheltering in place, and this uh, was interesting. From uh, 1918. Um, those that sheltered in place the longest turned out to economically actually do better and actually have lower mortality as well. So uh, this is so these examples are both the top one says between similar cities, places with longer running interventions had lower mortality. So that's interesting. Um, and then the second one, uh, by the way, San Francisco in 1918, we sheltered in place, you know, or we had less social distancing than LA, for example. And then the second bottom part says those same cities also had higher employment gains. Pretty interesting. So that was 1918. Granted, it's a long time ago and data was different back then. Um, if you look now um, and extrapolate sort of looking at deaths, you can see where we are here. US doubling rate 2.7 days. That was as of last week. And then Florida doubling rate 3.1 days in New York 2.4 days and as you uh, as you may have heard you know New York is starting to have a shift you can see how they're sort of coming down a bit there's a bit of a change from that slope a bit of the, the beginning of a flattening of the curve another way to look at it here um, is looking deaths by state and you can see you know two weeks ago what the, the slope doubling New York is doubling every two days um, and look at California as well in the yellow orange there, doubling quite rapidly. And now if you move forward a couple of weeks, April 8th on the right hand side, you can see New York now is shifting to doubling every three days. And then you can see how that slope is changing a lot. Um, and uh, you can see Washington, California. So pretty interesting. A lot's happened in the past two weeks um, since 90, I think it's 97 percent, I think, um, of the um, states are in doing sheltering in place. Um, locally in San Francisco, um, this is what the caseload looks like with, with 10 deaths. Um, you can see here that, that you don't, you see a bit of a shift in the slope, but not huge. Um, but there is a bit of a shift. You can see how it was exponentially growing and now it's starting to shift, which is great to hear. Uh, half the cases are under um, you can see there half the cases are under 40, um, which is or almost half the cases, which is a bit concerning, which is why people are coming down pretty hard on people under 40 to really try and do their best. Um, and you can see the predominance here of um, transmissions through the community, uh, not through a known case. Um, you may have heard that uh, about um, ethnicity and how that's playing a role in how people are being um, affected by this disease um, with a, a higher proportion of particularly African Americans, as I understand it, I haven't seen all the data yet, um, being affected uh, and infected and also a high proportion of um, or greater severity and greater deaths, almost three to four fold, depending on which city you're looking at quite concerning. Currently, they're thinking, you know, there's, they are, there's a higher, there's clearly health disparities across socioeconomic class and including race uh, as part of that socioeconomic class. Uh, so there's some, you know, correlating across those two. 
uh, and clearly that plays a role in health disparities. And we know that diabetes, high blood pressure, and other health conditions like that play a role in the severity of your illness. So they're trying to tease that all out now, but unfortunately that is the newest information coming out. These are just hospitalizations and you can see um, the doubling rates are decreasing a bit over time, which is, uh, which is nice to see as that slope changes. This is UCSF, UCSF Medical Center itself uh, and really the current uh, census. Um, and you can see week over week, there is an increase, but the, it's about 10 to 15%. So a doubling rate more like seven days, um, which is great to see. So. Um, so I want to spend a moment uh, talking about um, transmissibility and I showed this slide last time and hand washing clearly is important in doing it right and teaching the kids to do it right, meaning that we should be getting you know, our fingernails, we should get between our fingers and really soap things up and that the soap itself the, uh, will actually decompose the, the virus itself, the cell wall and kill it. And that's what we want to be doing. Um, so this conversation about masks. So this is a picture from 1918 from 1918 pandemic. Wear a mask or go to jail. So this was done over 100 years ago. And at the same time, we have the Surgeon General at the end of February saying, seriously, people stop buying masks are not effective in preventing the general public from catching coronavirus. True, if healthcare providers can't get them to care for six patients, it does put them at risk. But his first statement, they are not effective in preventing general public from coronavirus. This is from our US Surgeon General. So what's the actual statistics? Because I believe in science and hopefully our Surgeon General one day will too. Um, if you look at this, you'll see that wearing a mask has a 68% effectiveness rate. If you go down to the fourth, the third row, wearing a mask, five studies, the odds ratio is 0.3%, 0.32 actually, which means you get a 68% benefit reduction in getting a virus if you wear a mask. Well, I would say that works. Um, and then wearing an N95 mask, even better. We'll talk a bit more about that. So then you got wearing gloves and, and other, other options here as well disinfection, the first column showing a 70% effectiveness rate. So in frequent hand washing, reducing about 55%. That would be greater than 10 times a day. So that's truly frequent. So let's talk a little bit about how are people getting stuff again, one more time. I just want to show this from a different lens and talk about masks for a moment. So when you cough, you've got, or sneeze or, um, or exhale, you've got big droplets and you've got small droplets and the big droplets are coming from your upper airway um, and the small ones less than 10 micron uh, uh, microns are coming from the deep bronchioles down deep into your lung okay so that's an important thing to differentiate between um, and the only way to really get those out is by a big sneeze typically more like a cough really will get a lot of those from deep within out. Now you can aerosolize with sneezing or coughing. And you can see here though, that uh, for most people with just exhaling, you know, it doesn't go very far. Um, so then the question is well, how, how, how helpful are masks? So there's two sides of that conversation. One is protecting yourself and the other one is protecting yourself from others or, and the other is vice versa. So protecting others from you. So if you were infected, maybe you're asymptomatic and, and are carrying the virus with you. So the first one here, protecting yourself, what does that show? Well, if you have a homemade tea cloth versus a surgical mask versus a true N95. So it looks like for protecting yourself that the particles leak through a mask. If you have an N95 and you're wearing it correctly, only one particle should get through compared to a surgical mask, 25, versus a homemade one, 33. So clearly, even the homemade ones are actually helping, right? Cutting it down by two thirds. Clearly, the N95s are superior, but right now they're on low supply for healthcare providers, which really need it. 
And then there's ones that are in between that are not quite an N95 grade, but that are um, so a little bit better than surgical masks or surgical masks themselves. So those are the things to consider. Now, what about the other part of the equation, which is you may be asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic and you wanna protect yourself from giving it to others. And you can see here, it's not quite as good. Even in N95, actually, you get 30 particles leaking outwardly, um, but clearly better than nothing and clearly better than a tea cloth, you know, a, a homemade cloth that you wrap around it yourself, which barely does anything because the projectile force is so strong that it just blows right through that. So I wanted to give a little bit of perspective on that. And again, this is just sort of going through what I was saying before, which is the small teeny ones, the aerosol, there is the ones that will make it all the way down into your lung. Whereas the big droplets get stuck in the upper airway. But that is where we think the initial site of infection is, is, is in this upper airway. So coughing and sneezing, you know, doesn't really typically go too far, um, but it can sort of aerosolize into that space, right? So that's the advantage of wearing a mask. So this goes back to, should you wear a mask? My answer is yes. Do you have to always wear it? You know, you don't need to wear it driving in a car. I see a lot of people driving in the car wearing a mask, but all that's going to do is make you touch your mask when you're not paying attention because you're focused on driving, you know, pay attention to what your hands are doing. You really need it when you're in close proximity or in small quarters. So if you go into an elevator, if you're shopping in a grocery store, um, if you're in a crowded space, then you want to wear one. If you're outside, then again, you're in open space. And as long as you're apart from other people, then you don't necessarily need to, to wear one. Um, okay, so, and then the other thing I want to talk a little bit about is, this is from a slide from last week. It's just talking about how people are presenting. And there's a lot of confusion, and rightfully so, because the CDC and many other national bodies have really made this confusing um, because partly they would only test people who were the most severe. So if you remember, it was cough, shortness of breath, fever. Um, and now they're broadening it a little bit more. But the truth is people are presenting in all sorts of ways. So some people are having change in their bowels, some people are having change in their taste buds and, and smell. Other people are having headache and sore throat and fatigue. Uh, then a cough comes. The predominant one is a cough because it really hits the respiratory system. So just keep that in mind. If you don't have a cough, um, the odds are much lower that you actually are having something happening, but still possible, but a lot lower. Uh, the other thing I want to bring to mind, and I don't know if anyone's seen Chris Como's discussion where he talks about his experience, but um, I was quite taken by it. Um, and then I saw another interview he did with a doctor that showed his chest x-ray and it was pretty clear he actually never did have pneumonia, if I understood that correctly, but he was acting as if he did have pneumonia. Um, and he was saying how you have to keep moving and you have to resist the virus. The virus wants to take you down and wants to make you lie there and don't succumb to it. And you have to get up and do stuff. Let me let me reframe that in a different way and say that the way the, the lungs work is at first they're super light um, and almost like a balloon and almost like they can float. They're really light and they have these small little airways and it's very light and fluffy. As if you get a pneumonia, which means infection down into the lung itself, not the upper airway, but the lower airway in the lungs, then that starts to change because you have virus down there and your body starts fighting the virus. But again, some people just have a headache, they'll have a sore throat, they have a cough, they've got maybe a runny nose, they have fatigue. That's not necessarily pneumonia. It's when you really start to have these other symptoms where you start to have difficulty with your breathing. Then you start worrying about, oh, has it dropped into my lungs? So there's a big bifurcation there. And it's unclear to me if that's what happened to uh, Chris Cuomo or not, if he had a true pneumonia or not. His chest x-ray or CT scan, I think it was just a chest x-ray, didn't show a clear pneumonia, although he was describing symptoms that maybe, maybe perhaps made it, made it sound like it. So it's hard for me to know, but what I can tell you is if you could develop a pneumonia that's concerning, you'll start to notice you're short of breath. You'll start to notice that you're having trouble catching your breath. Um, and that, again, what ha what's happening in the body is there's fluid that starts filling up 
in the lungs themselves because the body's fighting the virus. And when the body fights the virus, there's collateral damage and immune cells break down and they, they release these enzymes and these things called cytokines that start to break down the normal healthy tissue. And so you get this reaction and fluid starts filling up in the lungs. And when that fluid fills up in the lungs, what normally happens is the air drops all the way down into the lung and goes through this very thin membrane and hops right into a red blood cell and takes off. And now that red blood cell has got oxygen on it and that red blood cell carries it to some part of your body and releases the oxygen into your cell. And then your body feels nourished and then that happens over and over again. When the fluid fills up, it, it, then it becomes a barrier making it hard for the oxygen to get across into that bloodstream to get on that red blood cell. So certain parts of your lung may have fluid in it and it can't then diffuse across as well, but other parts are getting air. So when people lie down, for example, and David, when he explained what happened to him last week, when he's lying down, the fluid then layers across all of your back, across the whole part of your lo that lung. And that will make it more likely for you to cough and more likely for it to be difficult for you to catch to breathe, which is why people tend to prop up and then the fluid pools down towards the bottom, covering less surface area, allowing your lungs to breathe more easily and get more oxygen into your body. So I hope that makes sense, but I really wanna clarify that. The reason we talked about the oxygen concentration machines that many of you purchased is those, when you get to a point where you have a pneumonia and your pneumonia is progressing to a point where you're not, can't get enough oxygen, even sitting upright, that your oxygen levels start dropping and you would know that because you would have an oxygen machine, uh, a pulse ox we call it, that put on your finger, that many of you done when you come to the clinic, put it on your finger and it tells you your oxygen level. If that starts dropping below 92, 93, you know, ideally it's 97 and above, if it starts dropping, that means you're not able to get enough oxygen because the fluid's building up. And therefore, that's when you use the oxygen concentration machine because it could provide supplemental oxygen instead of normally having 21% oxygen in the atmosphere, now you have extra oxygen coming in at 97% purity, flowing at two liters or four liters, going right in through your nose, giving you extra oxygen. And then if that starts progressing and that's not enough, then we have the face mask and we can go even five liters, 10 liters, and get this pure 100% oxygen into the body which really supplements you to increase your oxygen levels. And you would be checking your oxygen pulse oximetry to see if your oxygen levels are improving. Of course, you'd be working closely with your doctor. Um, and so we'd be tight doing this hand in hand. It would be a close conversation. But I wanted to give some clarity around how people are presenting this conversation about pneumonia. Many people have pneumonia, don't need any oxygen supplementation. They ride through it and do fine. Some people progress and do, and then need to be hospitalized for the oxygen supplementation primarily. Okay, so I'm gonna spend a moment talking about testing. So there's two big categories. There's do I have the acute infection? Or is the virus in my body? Do I have this thing called COVID-19? And then the second one is, did I have this thing called COVID-19 and now I have antibodies to it? And so now I'm, we think hopefully immune. We still don't know the answer to that, but we're hoping that these IgM and IgG in particular antibodies suggest that we actually are immune to it and go, can go back in and not get it again. So as you know, there's testing centers all over popping up or that are currently here at UCSF. Their throughput is now, they're able to do a thousand a day they're only having to run, I forget the stats now, I have them from before, a few hundred internally a day, two or 300. So they're pulling from in general, they're pulling from other places that are, that are doing the swabs and they're all going to UCSF to be processed because they have a, a huge volume that they can do. Um, Stanford also has good capacity. So those are the main centers that are doing the, the processing. Um, and quickly other companies are coming into the private sector and starting to create labs. But thanks to Stanford and UCSF that really got up and running quickly. That's the PCR testing. And we talked about the machines that do that. And uh, then there's the serology testing, which is these antibodies, which help us look at whether or not you have now antibodies to this. Um, and there's a national rollout happening as we speak over the next couple of weeks. Uh, 
we will see this roll out. And um, what's exciting about that is we'll be able to see, oh, it was COVID-19 that I had. Now, the question is how good are these tests? And many of these tests are easy. It's a finger stick, you know, and you get a little bit of blood, you put it onto the this little cartridge and it with, you add a little reagent to it, the doctor has to do this, and then it gives you your result pretty quickly. Um, the question is how accurate is that result? And we don't know the answers to that. And that's part of the, so I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about teaching you a little bit about tests, diagnostic tests. What do they mean? How do they work? What are some of the challenges about them? So diagnostic tests, um, and it was a nice article in Stat News. Um, so I'm pulling some information from that. Um, and from uh, some other places. So when you think about test characteristics of a test, so the truth is you either have a disease or you don't, that's the truth, right? So if you think about if God knew you do have this disease or you don't, that's the sort of reality we're trying to work in. And then the question is, how does the test correlate with the truth? That VE means a positive test in this case or a negative test, so a negative sign or a positive sign. So in the first column, if you have a positive test, right, and you have the disease. So, and then there's something called sensitivity, which means the ability of this test to correctly identify those people that have the disease. And that is basically you take everyone with the disease, and then you figure out how many got a positive test, and how many got a falsely negative test. FM means falsely negative, and TP means truly positive. So 100 people with the disease, 90 of you guys got it actually saying it's positive. 10 of you said it was negative, but we knew you had the disease. The sensitivity then is out of 100 people, 90 were positive, 90%. Now, what about this? And that's important if you're screening um, um, something that's really worrisome, let's say HIV. You want to make sure you grab everyone that has HIV because that's a potentially lethal condition. It's, there's good treatment for it. You want to find everyone. You want a really highly sensitive test. You don't want to miss somebody that actually has it and they're falsely negative. Specificity is sort of the other part of that conversation, which is the ability of the test to correctly identify who doesn't have the disease, okay? who does not have the disease. So in that case, you're looking at true negatives is what you want to figure out. So if 100 people take the, the test, none of them we know. We know none of these people have the disease and 100 take it. And 90 say come back negative, but 10 show that they're, they're actually positive, but they really don't have the disease. Then we have a problem where 10 people think they have a disease. Now, for example, with HIV, you don't want to be falsely positive. That would be a bad thing. So that's why for HIV, for example, they have an ELISA test and then they have a Western blot. The ELISA test is highly sensitive and not as specific as it could be. And the Western blot is highly specific, but not as sensitive as it could be. So it's done in that order. Oh, you may have HIV, ELISA test. We're gonna confirm this with a second test to make sure indeed it wasn't a false positive. Now, when people come up to me and they say, hey, Brad, I did this test and it was positive. Does that mean I had COVID-19? That's a different question and that's the just looking across the table here are the PPV and the NPV, which is the positive predictive value of a test and the negative predictive value of a test. And this is really sort of relevant to us in our clinical sort of thinking like, do I have this or not? I got a test, should I get a test or not? And this positive, these are predictive values, okay? Now the thing about these is it depends what the underlying prevalence is in the population that you're testing. So for example, um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, it's probably pretty low. So there's a good chance that we might be making mistakes. And I'll tell you about this. So there's something called the positive predictive test. Again, it's a proportion of people with a positive test result that are really positive, okay? And then same with the negative as well. So if you go back to this thing, so it's the true positives amongst those that got a positive test, the true positives plus the false positives, and similarly with the negatives. So here's a scenario. So consider the scenario where you have an asymptomatic or mild population, and let's say 2% have it, 
let's say, which say was the estimate for the uh, NBA actually. And uh, now assume the test is, is always positive in individuals with the disease, but falsely positive in 10%, 10% of the time, which would be a pretty good test. So the chance of someone having with a positive test actually infected is actually less than 20%. Wow. So let me say that again. If it's a really good test and you assume that the test is always positive in people with the disease, but sometimes it gives you a false positive rate 10% of the time, that means that one out of six people that get a positive test actually have it. And five out of six times someone got a positive test, they don't really have the disease. So when people are asking me now, and I'm asking myself now, should I go get tested? Because I think I may have had COVID-19. Should I go get tested for the antibody test? There's a whole bunch of companies out there are flooding, they're about to flood the market. There's one right now, a company in Richmond. They're charging $120 for their test. The test probably cost them anywhere from one to three dollars, just so you know. They got it out of China. They what's the likelihood of how reliable is that test? We don't know. They I asked them to send me some data on it to see how and their data sets on very small number of people. So these tests really need to be vetted before we can say clearly that you guys, we should all get tested and we should then trust the results of that test. That's my big concern. So uh, we'll get data pretty quickly, um, but we don't have it now. So um, my, my sort of feedback is that we need to wait and, and see. Um, Mary, do you have any tests, any, any thoughts on, on this since you spend much of your career building out laboratory diagnostic tests across the world? Yeah, I'm a big proponent for confirmatory testing. That's just the, the nature of the business. And uh, the only other thing I would add regarding specificity is that there are different strains of virus out there. I'm not speaking specifically about COVID. COVID is, there's COVID, there's SARS-CoV-2, there's SARS-CoV, and then there's MERS-CoV. And so um, sometimes we get false positives with these tests because they're binding to different strains of virus within a larger family of viruses. And um, we, we see that very, very often. And, and scientists will spend many months, if not years, trying to perfect a test to remove that specificity. But as you pointed out, Brad, sometimes we do multiple types of tests. You mentioned ELISA and Western blot. Um, you know, so I think when we talk about SARS-CoV-2, um, you know, that PCR coupled with an ELISA test would be great because uh, there's lots of reasons for that anyway, because we want to look at the serology regardless to see how well somebody is mounting an immune response or not. Um, it tells us something about the time course of illness, et cetera. So um, I, I think whenever we speak about testing, I'm all for confirmatory testing. So that's, that's what I would say to that. Yeah. What's your thoughts on how long it might take for them to really, you know, develop a, a protocol that makes sense for everyone to get tested and to believe the results? Do you have a sense for that? Uh, I just based upon what I'm hearing in the community. Um, and as we've said on prior calls, I don't know a single scientist who isn't working on this right now. Um, and, and what I'm glad to hear is that the scientists who are your vaccinologists are working on vaccines. Your scientists who you are, are your uh, immunologists, they're working on the serology. Um, so everybody's doing exactly what they're most talented at. I would be surprised if we didn't have something in play by the fall. And I think that also goes for antivirals as well. And the reason why I think that is the case is to develop, to validate your antivirals, to validate your vaccines, to do those important clinical trials, you're going to need these tests in place. You're going to need a really good serological assay in order to do those validation tests. And so um, I think we have a lot of people racing to get those effective assays in play so that we can get the clinical trials underway. Um, I, I, there's so much momentum going on right now in the field and it's global. 
it's not just us, it's across the globe. So I think by the autumn, we should see something that we can feel confident about. Don't hold me to that though, if in the fall yeah. you're all throwing darts at me. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so I thought now we could like just move a little bit towards prevention and treatments, uh, not so much treatment, but really around prevention, um, maybe a little around treatment um, if people have mild cases. And a lot of this information um, came from both my own sort of knowledge base as well as uh, University of Arizona, uh, Andrew Wiles group gave a nice symposium and sort of walked through some different, um, some nutrients and supplements. So a lot of it's based on animal data or, um, or in vitro uh, data or, you know, and then all of it's based on not COVID-19, but other viruses. So take all this with a grain of salt. Um, and I, but a lot of this, since the, a lot of this is, you know, you can find through the diet, what I'm going to talk about. Um, so completely harmless and, and actually healthy um, that you should be eating and doing anyway. And the other parts of it is even if you do do it supplement form, a lot of this I'm recommending to many of you anyway. So, um, but it's good to sort of walk through and just give you a little bit more um, flavor. So let me, um, see if I can get this up for you. Okay, so great. So, um, so there's a couple different parts of it, you know, how this may work. And I don't want to get in too much the pathophysiology of how these work, unless you guys really want me to, I'm happy to. But um, let me just break it down to sort of three big categories, which is one is how do we stop from the virus from sort of getting into, in, into our body? Let's say it lands in our mouth and, you know, or into our nose and then it sort of comes into our body. And you know, many of you probably heard about zinc for the common cold, and we think that that works by uh, preventing actually the virus from actually adhering to the mucous membranes and coming up into the body. Um, and also, we think it reduces viral replication. So zinc is one that you've heard of before, and I would just like the zinc lozenges that are sold for the common cold. Similarly, if I were exposed or thought I may have been exposed, I would go ahead and use that. Um, uh, to sort of reduce my concerns over a couple of days if in case I may have been exposed. Um, and, and then if I were to be, you know, initially ill, again, I would use it in the first phase of, of my illness as well. Um, the other things that have been looked at are vitamin D. There's some different studies that they found if lower vitamin D levels uh, are concerning for more severe disease. It's yet to be worked out. But again, I recommend people um, be in this, you know, above 30 and below 50, ideally, that there is some data showing above 50 people have, um, has some immune modulation effects that could be negative. Um, so I'm a believer in people being, you know, um, some people just through good um, genetics and digestion actually have adequate vitamin D levels with their normal outdoor activities, and some people don't. So in those cases, I, I'd supplement. And then quercetin, which comes from onions in particular, um, it can also be helpful. If you've ever used, this is also used for allergies. A lot of people, we use it with people that have allergies as well. Um, and this is thought to bind to this ACE2 receptor, which is, we think, the vehicle through which this virus gets in um, to the body and through the respiratory chain. Um, and so that can be helpful too. And there's something called astragalus. Astragalus has been used for a long time as a traditional herb. It's a great tonic. It's great. It's used in a lot of common cold herbal remedies as well. A lot of the ones that I would recommend have astragalus in it. Um, and that's also shown to be helpful. So if I were exposed, you, you know, I would, I would make sure I was doing vitamin D. I'd probably take the zinc and I'd probably take a herbal formula um, that has uh, astragalus or quercetin in it. Um, and um, yeah, so that's uh, one part of the equation. The other is this uh, N, um, nuclear factor kappa beta NFKB and something else called NLRP3, uh, which is thought to cause some of this inflammation that happens where our body overreacts to something and that creates this cytok cytokine storm that's been called, uh, what has now been called for people that are quite sick and the reason they're, they get, they're getting sick and then the body overreacts and causes more flooding in the lungs and starts causing other problems to the body, which 
makes people even sicker and that is because our own body is fighting against itself in essence so how do we sort of modulate that right now i like i showed last week ucsf is part of a study that's i think it's called the aster study that's looking at vitamin c as part of a larger one uh, regimen of multiple drugs vitamin c being included in one arm um, that's using a second drug as well so vitamin C, the dosing is a little unclear what they're going to use uh, in my mind, for what their doses are, but typically in at least for the common cold, the dose has been three grams. For some people, they get some GI side effects from that. They can get, you know, a little bit of GI distress, a little bit of loose stools. Um, so I tell people to divide it up, do a gram a couple times a day. Um, some people do much higher doses, 10, 20 grams. Um, and it's being looked at, I think in that study, uh, using intravenous dosing at 20 grams is my recollection is correct. Um, melatonin, interesting, has also been looked at, and a lot of people use it for sleep. Um, the recommended dosing uh, is one to five milligrams for sort of sleep use, and it's been shown to have beneficial effects on the lung. Um, it also helps people with reflux. I've talked about that with many of you, where it actually reduces reflux because it affects the, gastro, uh, the GE uh, gastroesophageal sphincter. Um, but also can be helpful in this setting as well. So, and then the other components here, again, Kirschertin comes up again. This is sort of reduced that NL, the NLRP3 inflammasome. Um, so plant flavonoids, how do you get those? Eating lots of uh, vegetables. Um, so ideally, the more vegetables, the better. Uh, Kirschertin, again, we talked about already. Garlic, primarily you can do garlic pills, but often if you put it into your diet, they can be quite helpful. There's this sort of um, huge cytochrome storm that we've been talking about, the cytokine storm um, with the cy from the cytokines. So IL-6 is an example, TNF-alpha, these things by calming them down. Uh, and there's actually drugs being looked at right now to that affect interleukin-6 as well, for example. So this is how important these, some of these target cytokines are. And then EGCG, which you can get from green tea, which you can see is what's in my thermos right now. Um, I've been drinking lots of green tea. Um, I do that in general, but it's quite helpful. It has anti-cancer properties as well as, again, here for, for viruses. Um, the other, as you guys know, I'm a big fan of curcumin and a big fan of mushrooms, the medicinal mushrooms. And um, this has been shown to have really uh, profound effects on immunity and thought to have anti-inflammatory effects as well. So affecting that whole cytokine storm conversation we talked about earlier. Um, you can bring them into your diet. And then of course, uh, I use a lot of a particular host defense uh, product made by Paul Stamets. Um, and they have a Stamets 7, which I like a lot. Um, they have other ones as well, but the stem seven is a nice one that has many of these herbs that I have listed, or many of these mushrooms that I have listed here. I do that regularly um, on a daily basis as my tonic. And if I get ill, I, I double or triple the dose. Um, and now we have a powder version of it that we offer and you can find online as well, I'm sure, um, which actually is much more accessible. It's a bit stronger and is actually less expensive because it's just in a bucket with powder. Um, then there's curcumin. Everyone, people are quite familiar with curcumin. It comes from turmeric, which is a root, as a spice um, coming from India. And the dosing is pretty broad. Um, it's really well tolerated at higher doses. Um, very little side effects and in drug interactions other than some interactions around, um, theoretically around blood thinning, but um, really good for the liver as well. So, uh, I'd recommend as a daily, I recommend a lot of people take one to two, five milligram, 500 milligram pills. Um, in the setting of being exposed or acutely ill, I would dramatically increase that towards the upper limits of what I put here. But I know people that take eight grams a day doing it for, for pain in particular. Um, all right, so that's sort of the big tour, which gives me right now, yeah, so we've got about 10 minutes. Um, so let me just transition here and just mention for next week, I'm going to spend some time. There's more and more interest looking at convalescent serum. So we'll talk a little bit about that next week and some of the, um, some of the other studies going on, for example, looking at interleukin-6 and some other treatments. So um, I thought I would speak to some of that for next week, just to give you a little inkling of what we'll talk about.
um, in the weeks to come. So if anyone has any questions, please send them our way. Um, love to sort of answer. I know that uh, up front while I'm waiting, I'll just bring up that people ask about blood donations. Um, so let me speak to that on a couple different parts. So one part is um, there is a big need for blood donations. Uh, UCSF, um, Stanford, or in general, all um, are requesting blood donations because everyone's sheltering in place and there's less activity around that. So um, I do recommend that. Um, and, and they do a good job um, sort of allow, creating a, a sterile space so that you're not risking being exposed to COVID-19. Um, it's by appointment, for the most part, appointment only right now. Um, and it's easy to find online. Um, the other question um, is um, it related to um, just how, how convalescent serum works. Let me speak to that. And just to, to say it one more time, so there's a Q&A button down there in the bottom. So if you do have a question, uh, please go ahead and send some my way. Um, the, with respect to sort of um, convalescent serum, so for plasma, what they do is they'll, they'll take people that were known to be infected and then they'll you basically put two IVs in you. So they take one IV out and draw your blood out. Then they separate your, your blood and pull away your plasma. And in your plasma are your antibodies. And then, then they bring back in through the other IV, which goes through this machine, to give you your red blood cells back. So you know when you donate blood, you're giving your packed red blood cells. They want that to give to people to donate blood. In this situation, they, if it's so, they're for convalescent serum, we want, to, we want people who we know have been sick, they're antibody positive, and, um, and that's what we, that we're taking. So we're taking your plasma, and in, within that, there's these proteins, these antibodies that are proteins, and then we're giving you back your red blood cells. Um, and so you've got sort of two, basically two IVs hooked up. One's coming out, the other one's coming back in. Now, we don't know, is it better that you were super sick and then got better? Is it better that you were mildly sick and then you got better? Um, this is all being figured out. We don't fully understand who's the best person to take these, this convalescent serum, serum from. Um, so we're basically right at this point taking all comers and we're trying to then study it. Um, is it better to take it from a young person or an old person? Did someone uh, have a mild experience because their antibody response was so strong? Did someone who got super sick get super sick because their antibody response wasn't strong enough or the antibodies weren't as good? Or is it because they as a result of being so sick, they were able to mount a huge antibody response because they were so sick. All this stuff is being worked out um, and it's, it's super early to really figure that out. So um, there is opportunity to do this. Um, there are centers that are, are requesting plasma, UCSF being one location. They want to make sure that you have been sick. And so they're asking you to sort of fill out some forms as a screening in advance. So Great. And Mary, do you have any thoughts or comments? I just wanted to add something for maybe the topic of discussion for next week. You and I haven't had a chance to discuss this, but I've been reading a few articles regarding breathing exercises for people who, as a prevention measure, if you're already positive and you want to help limit the uh, potential for getting that pneumonia or for when you have the pneumonia to help um, alleviate it and and this is something that sits in your ballpark not mine so that's why i wanted to mention it also i've read about um uh, the way one uh, would remain um like let's say if you're lying down not to be lying on your back flat that you might remain on your side i've actually seen photographs out of the icu of people being placed on their bellies um so that's just something i was curious about myself yeah, great. Thanks for that. Yeah. So you guys, I don't know if you've seen it, but I've, I've been sent from from my patients uh, videos of people doing all sorts of things. So, you know, they'll show, they'll sort of come up and show the hold for five seconds. And then hold for five seconds. Right. And then they do a cough and they do all these different examples. 
and this this person's a pulmonary doctor, and then there's a nurse working in the ICU. You may have seen that video that came out of the UK. Uh, got Chris Cuomo telling you what to do also. So here, let me give you some context. So thanks for that question, right? Um, so here's the context. If you're sick, some of these things can be helpful, aka if you're sick with pneumonia, some of these things be, can be helpful. If you're healthy, there's no reason to do these exercises. Exercise on a regular basis. That will completely manage your lungs in all the ways that it needs to be. It'll flush it out, it'll flush your system out, it'll energize your immune system. Get great sleep. Why it reboots your immune system stronger than pretty much anything you could think of doing if you get good sleep, get sufficient sleep. Many of us are having a hard time getting sufficient sleep because we're stressed out, we're worrying. So how do you manage that? Mind-body practices, you know, maybe for some people it's exercise. For some people, for many of us, me included, turn off screens, you know, 30 to 60 minutes before you're going to go to bed because otherwise your mind's just churning, especially what I've been doing at times is reading a lot of the news because I want to catch up on what's happened to get the latest stats and stuff so I understand things. And then, you know, your mind's turning. So, you know, start with stress management. Um, for a lot of us, exercise can help with that. And exercise then helps our lungs as well. So if you do get sick, and you think you have developing pneumonia, again, come talk to your doctor, me. Um, but let's say you are sick. Then th what you're hearing out there about these lung exercises, the reason is, back to what I was saying earlier, is if you get sick and you get a pneumonia, two steps down the road now, and it's pretty bad, three steps down the road, right? This is pretty far down the path of severity, which most people won't experience. Then you wanna optimize your oxygenation more oxygen, the better your chance of healing, right? So how do you do that? Lying flat, like I said earlier, on your back, you, it covers a huge surface area of fluid if you have fluid in your lungs from your pneumonia. Why do you have fluid in the lungs from pneumonia? Because there's a virus, the virus is being attacked by your immune system, there's warfare going on. As a result, things get, uh, cells die, and so they explode, and there's fluid in all the cells, and that creates leakage, and then there's there's get loosening of some of the separation of that membrane that separates the blood from the air and that gets loosened. So then plasma fluid from the bloodstream goes into your lungs. So you get all this fluid. So if you're lying on your back, it's going to pool and then it covers all the zavioli, which are the little, little sort of uh, pockets that, or the spot where the air comes in. It's super thin layer moves across and goes in your bloodstream. If that's covered with fluid, then you can't get across. So people are sitting upright more. Like David, who was telling us last week, had to prop up a lot at night to sleep and because he'd be coughing. Why? Because the body doesn't knows that covering all that lung surface area is bad and so it makes you cough to try and get rid of it. So in those situations, then you want to do things. Uh, and the one guy in that video talked about atelectasis. What is atelectasis? It means a collapsed lung. So the bombs of our lungs will get collapsed if we're not moving our diaphragm a lot, or if you're lying and not moving much in bed. These parts of our lungs start collapsing down, so we have less lung now that's able to oxygenate. So if you hold your breath, that puts some pressure, and then in particular cough, <coughs> that puts auto peep, it'll put what's called positive end expiratory pressure, which is what a ventilator will do also. It has positive inspiratory pressure, and then we'll set for auto peep so that while they're exhaling, we have resistance against that exhalation. That's like coughing that happens. When you cough, it'll auto inflate your lung. So um, that's good because it'll pop it open and get these collapsed parts open again. Um, you don't need to do that if you're healthy. That's only if you're sick and have pneumonia that you need to get, start thinking about these things. Um, and so I gave some people an example. When we do our breathing practice and meditation, and there's that long exhalation that we do, where, and it's as if you're blowing through a reed instrument, then you get back pressure. That auto inflates your lungs. So it's built into many meditation practices already to help augment our own respiratory system. And what I meant to mention last time, which I'll mention now, is the reason we tend to exhale longer, we ask you to exhale longer on exhalation than the inhalation is that exhalation, when done actively, 
in is re requires your diaphragm to engage. And the way to engage your diaphragm is through a nerve called the vagus nerve, because that innervates your diaphragm. The vagus nerve is part of the parasympathetic nervous system, the calming part of our nervous system. So when you sigh, or when you do meditation, you're these long exhalations, you're activating your parasympathetic system. You're activating the calming part of our nervous system. And that's what we need to sort of settle back in, right? So the reason they built in these meditations, and by the way, prayer, the rosemary prayer included, they studied this, that it invokes the same thing and it activates your parasympathetic system. It activates shifts in your brain, in your brain waves through the deeper brain waves get activated um, that are associated with deeper meditative practices. And so all this is built into these millennia of these sort of, you know, contemplative practices that we take for granted. Um, so that's a bit of a long winded expl explanation. Um, so someone was asking about Wim Hof and his method. Um, so, the, so that method uh, which deals with certain breathing practices and also using cold um, speaks to uh, a couple different pieces. So that cold exposure that many of you may have seen, if you don't, it's worth looking up Wim Hof. Um, interesting guy. He has, they've studied his physiology. He has unique physiology. So the fact that you can't spend an hour and a half covered in ice and snow, it, that's because your physiology is not like his. Um, but what that does, that is what we call hormesis, which will activate our system and activate our immune response and create neuroplasticity and create uh, basically an adaptive response that ultimately makes us younger for our given age. So it ultimately changes our, our biology and reduces our biological age, even though our chronological, chronological age hasn't changed. So I'm a big fan of those sorts of practices. Um, it's, and you can take it however you want. So that might be a cold plunge is what he does. He tells people to get in ice water uh, for a couple of minutes or longer, depending on where you are in this training and do certain breathing practices. And I think those are, can be really helpful. Um, and they really do augment our, our system um, and really help us sort of optimize our health. So it's five o'clock, we'll try and end on time. Um, thank you for your patience, your, your, your participation, your engagement. Mary, thank you for your input. And uh, we'll, yeah, we'll do this again next, next week. Um, if you have questions you wanna send in advance, feel free to do so. And we'll put this up uh, for those that want to watch it um, on YouTube who weren't able to watch it this time. So have a great uh, day, evening. If you're Jewish and observing Passover, a good Passover and a good Easter as well. And we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Take care.